Hi, everyone. Uh, happy New Year. Welcome to the 117th Online Spintronics Seminar. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Eric Montoya received his PhD from uh, Simon Fraser University with uh, Brett Heinrich and uh, did his postdoc at University of California, Irvine with uh, Professor Ilya Krivorotov. Um, he has been an assistant professor at the University of Utah since spring 2022, where he's uh, building a lab with a, a focus on magnetic materials and uh, spin physics. So since today he will talk to us about uh, their recent findings about uh, self-generated anomalous hall spin of the talk. So without further ado, Eric, please take it from here. Oh, but right. sorry, by the way, <laughs> it's the first time we're streaming on YouTube. And if you're watching this on YouTube and uh, if you have any questions, just type into the chat box and uh, we will convey that to Eric uh, after his talk is finished. Sorry okay. for the interruption. Oh, no worries. Thank you for the introduction and thanks for inviting me to talk about some more recent work. And thanks again to uh, Kirill and Shin for keeping this Spintronic seminar going. It's a very great service to the community. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a new spin orbit torque um, and just a bit of motivation. So we're interested in spin orbit torques and spin torques in general because uh, they allow the electrical manipulation of magnetic materials um, basically by using spin currents. Uh, these, you can drive exciting nonlinear dynamics and uh, induce in interesting spin textures and things like that. Uh, from an application standpoint, you can make uh, non-volatile memory, such as spin torque MRAM, um, make nanoscale sources of microwave radiation, uh, spin torque oscillators, and both these devices can uh, be incorporated to be uh, utilized for neuromorphic spintronic computing. Um, so yes, today I'm going to talk about a new spin orbit torque that we found that originates from anomalous Hall effects. Uh, and also show, show that we, this torque is large enough to drive a new type of spin torque oscillator. Um, and I'll also argue that together uh, with the spin hall torque and the planar hall torque that have been previously discovered, that this anomalous hall torque forms a triad of uh, hall type spin orbit torques that should be universally present in ferromagnetic, non-magnetic material systems uh, based on conductors. Okay, so just um, spin torques in the nutshell. Uh, we're, as I said, we're interested in manipulating magnetization. So the equation of motion is the of magnetization vectors, lambda Lipschitz Gilbert equation. Uh, magnetization is an angular momentum, so inherently it's a torque equation, and we're interested in torques. Um, so what's shown here in this cartoon is if we inject a spin current into a ferromagnetic material, uh, so this this processing. Uh, reg vector is meant to illustrate a magnetization vector uh, processing about an external field, uh, an effective field. If we inject a spin current, which is these down pointing spins going from left to right, this can exert an anti damping torque on magnetization. This allows the electrical control of magnetization, as I said. Um, and then, owing to magneto resistance effects, uh, the processing magnetization leads to resistance oscillations. So, dynamic magnetization implies dynamic resistance. And if the source of your spin current is some sort of DC charge current, you have a DC charge current uh, times a dynamic resistance. You have a dynamic spin voltage or dynamic voltage. And large torques can be used to drive uh, magnetization reversal. So that can how you make a memory. These persistent oscillations are how you can drive like a spin torque oscillator type device. Um, so as I mentioned that uh, these spin hall effects, the planar hall effects, and the anomalous hall effects that lead to torque are kind of, they're all intrinsically related. Um, and they're all examples of spin orbit torque. So just as an example, I'd like to use the spin hall torque or the spin hall effect as the uh, prototypical example of a spin orbit torque. So um, spin orbit torques as an experimentalist are interesting to me because these are relativistic quantum mechanical effects that you can realize at room temperature on a tabletop apparatus. Um, so for the spin hall effect, if you have a non-magnetic heavy metal, and by heavy metal, I mean something with a large spin orbit interaction, usually a large atomic number. Um, if you have an electric charge current here illustrated as these spheres, say going from the left to the right, this generates a pure uh, spin current in a transverse direction that flows perpendicular to this charge current. So this is the spin hall effect. 
Now, if you put a ferromagnetic material, um, say iron or permalloy, if it's a metal, uh, yttrium iron garnet, it can be a insulator such as that. Then the spin current can exert a spin hall torque uh, that has this form. And working out this double cross product, you can see that uh, this where M here is the magnetization direction and P is the direction of the spin current polarization, that this serves to align the magnetization to the polarization of the spin current. So in this case, this spin hall current is injected into a ferromagnet. This can modify the effect of damping in the system, uh, which I call anti-damping, as opposed to using terms like field-like and damping-like. Uh, and this, but this, I say anti-damping, but it can contribute positive or negative damping. Okay, so the spin hall torque can be used to uh, make memory devices. Uh, so in a switching device, this is an example of a three-terminal MRAM device that's been shown. Uh, it can dr drive these persistent auto oscillations to make a spin hall nano oscillator, of which many types have been shown. Um, it's been shown that these can be phase locked and these types of oscillators can be entrained to one another, which is useful for neuromorphic computing. So I'd just like to um, show the symmetry in what I'm going to be showing later is all of our studies are being done in bilayer nanowire geometries of what these different types of torques look like in these systems. So what I've shown here is the uh, coordinate system that I'll be using throughout the talk. So in, when I have a nanowire, the X direction is going to be along the length of the nanowire. The Z direction is uh, normal to the sur surface and the, uh, the substrate and the film. And the Y direction is just given by like a right-hand rule. Now, uh, the, these, all of these spin torques modify our LLG. Uh, and they, they basically they have different forms. So the, the form of the spin hall torque is given here, where the dependence of the spin hall torque is given by what's called a spin hall angle, which uh, characterizes the charge to spin conversion efficiency. The current density flowing in the normal metal, so this is the, like our spin hall material, and it's inversely dependent on the uh, thickness of the ferromagnet layer. That's what this DFM is. And so if we have such a geometry and we pass a positive current, what I'm showing as these red and blue spheres is the strength of anti-damping like torque. So for a magnetization pointing in the Y direction, this will lead to a large negative damping. And for under magnetization reversal, this leads to a large positive damping. And as you go away from the Y axis, the strength of this torque dies off. Okay, so that's the spin hall torque in a very quick nutshell. Um, so I've mentioned uh, that, I mean, that the we're interested in these spin torques and there's effects that we can see due to magneto resistance. But I'd just like to point out that spin torques and magneto resistances are intrinsically related. So for each discovered magneto resistance and spin, there's an associated spin torque that's been discovered or vice versa. So we had a giant magneto resistance and tunneling magneto resistance. A few years later, the associated torque, the spin transfer torque the first spin transfer torque discovered, uh, well, theoretically predicted, and then discovered. And then we, the spin hall torque was discovered, then spin hall resi magnetic resistance, uh, and so on. So Roshbach torque, Roshbach Edelstein magnetic resistance. And then the oldest, oldest known uh, magnetic resistance, the anisotropic magnetic resistance, which is the same effect as the planar hall effect, uh, the associated torque is the planar hall torque. So the question is, well, if we consider the anomalous Hall effect to be magneto resistance like, the question is, is there an associated anomalous Hall torque? Um, and before, so that will be the topic of today's talk. But before I get to that, I would like to just briefly um, go over the planar Hall torque um, and the toy model uh, to set up pedagogically how to explain how these, these, these anomalous Hall and, and planar Hall torques work. Okay, so the planar hall torque is an example of a self-generated torque or self-induced torque. And that is that the this torque acts on the FM that engenders the torque. Uh, another way of saying that is that the spin current that exerts this torque originates in the same ferromagnet that the torque is exerted on. In the case of the planar hall torque, the, the spin current, the, this torque is due to planar hall currents which are universally present in FM conductors. I mean, they can be positive, they can be negative, they can be small, so going between them, but they are allowed to be present in all FM conductors. And they can be seen in systems of uh, ferromagnetic normal metal systems with broken inversion symmetry. That's an important point. 
Uh, and so we published this this uh, this this work a couple years back. And to my knowledge, this is the first example of a self-generated torque. Um, and for more info, I point you to a few papers for planar hall torques and uh, a nice talk given by Chris Safransky uh, in the first year of the Spintronic seminar series. Uh, if you look in the archives, you can find that. And then um, uh, for more on self-generated spin orbit torques, uh, please go see this, this, this nice talk by Juan Carlos Rio Sanchez. Okay, so experimentally, what did we see for this planar hall torque? What I'm showing here uh, on the in this 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 left panel is measurements in the xy plane. So this is what we call in-plane measurements of torques. And is it, so on the x-axis is the angle phi here, which goes from x to y, and on the uh, y-axis is the change in line with with uh, charge current density in the ferromagnet. Um, which characterizes the strength of the torque. Now, for this system, we had, we in this system, our ferromagnet was a cobalt-nickel super lattice, and our normal metal on the bottom were effective, uh, basically, bilayers of tantalum gold, tantalum palladium, and, and uh, uh, plat or sorry, tantalum gold, palladium gold, and platinum gold. And what we saw is that in these in-plane measurements, we saw a torque with the symmetry of the spin hall torque that called a sine theta dependence, and it increased with increasing amplitude of spin hall angle, going from gold to plat palladium to platinum. So that's just what you would expect for a spin hall torque. However, when we rotated the magnetization in this YZ plane, here we saw a large spin orbit torque that was out of plan. And most importantly, we saw that the strength of the torque and the angular dependence sign of the torque didn't uh, depend on the uh, under on this on this under layer. So it was relatively the, it was roughly the same for gold, palladium, and platinum. So when we saw this, we thought that this can't be due to the uh, adjacent only due to the adjacent normal metal. It has to be something going on in the ferromagnet. Okay, so the the, the magnitude of the planar hall, hall torque was not strongly dependent on the adjacent normal metal. Uh, so we decided to introduce a toy model. And the starting point of that is basically the planar hall current. So in a ferromagnetic conductor, the spin orbit interaction gives rise to magnetization dependent spin polarized electric current. The, the magnitude depends on the direction of the magnetization. It flows parallel to the magnetization as shown in this cartoon here. It's polarized parallel to the magnetization. And this effect is what gives real, uh, rise to AMR and the planar hall effect. And we can call this the planar hall current. And it follows this form. It depends on the uh, the AMR ratio, if you will, and the uh, projection of the magnetization on the current direction, and it flows in the M direction. So this the simple equation is just basically the mathematical realization of these bullet points. Now, what we what we did is we introduced a toy model that if we have a spin current that's generated in our ferromagnet, if we put an adjacent normal metal then we can have spin transfer between the ferromagnet and the normal metal that goes across this interface. And in our in our geometry, this interface is in the z direction. So if you just take the component that goes across this interface, this is simply the planar hall current projected onto the z axis. And if you work out this, um, uh, it has this angular form, uh, which can be described like uh, by this equation here, this cosine theta, sine theta, cosine phi. And this is exa exactly the angular dependence that we're showing in as the solid lines that we are fitting to the data. So the angular dependence of this torque that we saw followed the Z component of the planar hall current. And that's the component that goes across the interface. Now, the next thing that we had to argue is that, well, what is this? So we have this transfer of spin angular momentum. Uh, what is, what, what, what else is necessary? So in the set in the steady state, we can't have a net charge flow across this interface. Uh, this is another way of saying we can't have infinite charge accumulation. So this implies that we have to have a backflow charge current. Now to have maximized the spin transfer across this interface, this backflow spin current or this backflow charge current must be spin unspin polarized. So the adjacent normal metal must be a good spin stink or a good spin scatterer. Okay, so to show that pictorially, um, 
in if we have a ferromagnet that's embedded between two uh, normal metal uh, layers, what there needs to be a spin scattering asymmetry between the two normal metals. So one of the layers must be a good spin sink, as I'm showing uh, in red, or and one of the layers must be a poor spin sink. Spin sink. The other way, this is just another way of saying we need broken inversion symmetry. Um, otherwise, the net spin transfer across uh, to the FM is zero. So. In the case where you have, say, a good spin sink on the bottom or a poor spin sink on the top, you would expect a large planar hall torque. If you have a good spin sink on both sides, you have efficient spin transfer at both interfaces. However, they're opposite signs and they compensate each other. So you would expect to see no planar hall torque in such a system. And if you have poor spin sinks on either side, then you have no net spin transfer at all. And you would also expect to see no planar hall torque. So then we did a series of experiments where we uh, we took the structure that we had. Um, we in these cobalt uh, tantal. What we found was interesting for the cobalt tantalum inter interface. This had a uh, zero spin mixing conductance in our system, and the tantalum on its own acted as a poor spin sink. However, with the insertion of a gold layer, the net layer turned into a good spin sink. We could actually put. Uh, another gold insertion layer on the top layer, and then we had two good spin sinks, and this actually turned off this planar hall torque effect. And then finally, we placed this tantalum layer with an aluminum oxide, which is this gold aluminum oxide uh, layer is a poor spin sink, and we recovered a large planar hall torque. So these experiments show that the planar hall torque is not purely interfacial. There's a non-locality -loc involved. The spin current needs to be absorbed somewhere, but it's not happening right at the interface. So it's not uh, due to some effect such as spin memory loss right at the interface or a Rochba-like torque directly at the interface. And so the planar hall torque actually has this, uh, this interesting symmetry. So again, this is showing for a similar to the spin hall angle, a planar hall torque angle with a positive planar hall torque angle, it would have this type of symmetry. What's interesting is that it's large in this XZ plane. It's a large torque out of plane, which is different than say spin hall torque and Rashbach torque. And uh, it actually shows four extrema in rotation under 360 degrees. And what's very interesting is that it's actually even under magnet uh, magnetization reversal. So if you reverse the magnetization, the torque doesn't change its sign. It's actually rotation by roughly 90 degrees. Um, and so this is the full form that you can find in this, this, this paper of the planar hall torque uh, that goes beyond our toy model. Um, and uh, written into this form, we've translated it into what to us as more experimentally accessible parameters. Uh, you can see in our recent archive paper. But this torque can actually be added just like the spin hall torque into a micro uh, magnetic or even a macro spin LLG solver uh, if you are interested in studying these types of dynamics. Okay, so um, the as I showed, uh, the spin hall effect leads to these transverse spin of polarized currents. The planar hall torque or planar hall effect also leads, leads to these transverse spin polarized currents. These transverse spin polarized currents uh, when going across an FM and M interface can lead to torques. So the question is, well, can the anomalous Hall effect lead to uh, a torque? And it's known that the anomalous Hall effect leads to transverse spin Hall currents. Um, and it's been theoretically predicted uh, that the anomalous Hall current can exert a spin transfer torque on another ferromagnet, which was shown just a few later. This was experimentally realized. Um, but the question that we were asking is, is there a self-generated spin orbit torque associated with the anomalous Hall effect? So this is essentially generating a, uh, a spin current using the anomalous Hall effect, but it's still a spin transfer torque. So what we're looking, what we're looking for is a little, is, is different. It, we're looking for a self-generated spin orbit torque. Uh, okay, so as an experimentalist, one of the first things I ask me, myself is what material system should we use to look for such an effect? Um, and so uh, we went um, to this, 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 this quite useful paper by McGuire and Potter that goes over um, magneto resistance effects uh, in, uh, in various metallic alloys. 
uh, ferromagnetic metallic alloys. And you can see that it's it's quite well known that nickel iron alloys, so the, the most famous would be permaloy, this nickel 80 iron 20 concentration. However, if we change the nickel iron concentration, we can tune the anomalous Hall effect uh, quite quite strongly with the nickel concentration. So, And it has a very strong anomalous Hall effect that can go from positive to negative. Um, furthermore, it's been shown that even within the same alloy concentration, that by uh, using growth morphology, so this is not what we'll be doing this studies, but we can think to the future, is we can actually, with disorder, we can change the strength and even sign of anomalous Hall effects in these, in these alloys. Okay, so the, the idea is we wanted to choose a material system where we can significantly tune the anomalous Hall effect. Um, so here's a, just a cartoon of our heterostructure design. We start with a sapphire substrate. We use as a, uh, our uh, spin sinking layer, this, we again use this gold tantalum bilayer. The tantalum is an efficient spin scatterer, so it acts as a sink. It's highly resistive. That's important because the self-spin orbit torque is proportional to current densities flowing within the ferromagnetic material. So we don't want our adjacent non-magnetic materials to be shunting all of our current. It'll reduce our effects. Um, and also the tantalum grows a more resistant nanocrystalline. This leads to very smooth films, uh, promotes good growth, and this leads to sharp, interface, uh, sharp interfaces. Uh, we use the gold layer again. Uh, this is playing two roles, so it has a good spin mixing conductance. If it's very thin, not too much bias current goes through it, we're actually going to use this as a strip line for fMR. So this gold layer will always provide a Nersted field. So our, as I'm going to show, our measurements are going to be spin torque ferromagnetic resonance measurements, where if you have small spin torques, you're not going to see much signal. So if you always have an Ersted field, uh, you can you can measure this, what what's called SDFMR, but it's more analogous to say uh, just strip line fMR. Uh, and then we use this these nickel iron layers. We keep these at five nanometers. The reason five nanometers is just a compromise that it's thick enough to give us a good uh, ferromagnetic response. However, the spin torques uh, are, they are interfacial effects, um, but they're not purely at the interface, but they should follow a one over the thickness of the ferromagnet as I'm illustrating by DFM here. And then the aluminum oxide is just an insulating capping layer, which is a poor spin sink. So we, in these in these devices, we have a poor spin sink on the top. We have a good spin sink on the bottom. So the first thing we do is we um, we make uh, hall bars so that we can quantify the uh, anomalous hall charge effects. And I'm using the term charge here. This is just what you would typically just call anomalous hall effects because there are spin counterparts. And just to keep it... Um, uh, keep things straight. I'm going to try to remember to say charge whenever it's the what you would call the normal anomalous Hall effect. So uh, we measure the anomalous Hall resistivity uh, in these samples, and we see that, in fact, that we have a large anomalous Hall resistivity that's tunable by the nickel alloy concentration, which is shown on the x-axis here, anomalous Hall charge resistivity on the y-axis, uh, and it follows a similar dependence that we expect from film type measurements. Uh, furthermore, we measure the longitudinal charge resistivity uh, in these samples. It follows a tremendous like this. And we can take the ratio of the anomalous Hall charge resistivity, which is the transverse resistivity, to the longitudinal resistivity and define what's typically in the literature called an anomalous Hall angle. Uh, and I'll try to call that the anomalous Hall, anomalous Hall charge angle. And that's the, the basically the ratio of the uh, anomalous Hall charge resistivity to the longitudinal resistivity. So we, in fact, can tune in these systems this anomalous Hall charge effect. What we then do is we make nanowire devices um, using e-beam lithography and ion mill etching techniques. And these, these nanowires are, uh, we start with our film and then we pattern these into uh, 56 nanometer by 30 micron long mat uh, uh, nanowires, and then we attach uh, leads and subsequent lift off, uh, deposition and liftoff process to define an active region that's uh, on the order of 100 to 350 nanometers. And then when we apply currents or micro microwave currents or DC currents, the current densities are only large within this active region, and that's where our signal is going to come from, whether it's magnetic resistance, spin torque fMR, and what will show microwave emission. So all of our signal is coming from what's shown in false color here as this blue, that's our nanowire. 
So the main characterization technique we're using is what uh, is spin torque ferromagnetic resonance. Uh, and as I, as I said before, this is actually a combination of spin torque drive and Ersted field drive. Uh, so in this, in this system, we inject microwave uh, current up, up across the RF uh, port of a bias T directly into our sample. And then under Ersted, either Ersted or spin torque drive, we have dynamic magneto resistance that's at the same frequency as this microwave drive. And this makes a rectified voltage so we have basically say cosine squared. This gives us a DC component that we can measure along the low frequency arm of a bias T. And then what we're gonna also use uh, field modulation so that we can use phase sensitive detection to enhance our signal to noise ratio. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna, uh, we also apply a DC bias to the sample uh, so that under spin torques, we have this charge to spin current conversion. Okay, so what's shown on the, on the right is the typical spin wave uh, um, eigenmode um, spectra. Uh, so shown on the x-axis is the applied magnetic field. And in this case, it's it's applied at this angle of 330 degrees. So this is a, in this YZ plane. Uh, and so it's it's out of plane measure, measurements. And I just note that the uh, range is clipped here on the vmix or this SDFMR signal to illustrate that we actually have these higher order modes. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the dynamics of this uh, lowest order spin wave mode that I've labeled spin wave, spin wave one uh, as a function of DC bias. Okay, so what does that look like? Okay, so here's a trace. So this is basically, we take this three dimensional parameter space and we take a slice of it uh, to make this two dimensional parameter space where now the x-axis is the, um, the, the magnet, applied magnetic field and the y-axis is our SDFMR response. And we see that we have these three spin wave modes that we can resolve. And we're gonna look at this highest field uh, spin wave mode. We're gonna look at its line width as a function of DC bias because the line width is proportional to the damping. And an anti-damping torque changes the, the damping with applied say DC current. Okay, so when we apply one current density uh, say positive one milliamps, we see that there's actually a widening of the spin wave mode. And, and uh, when we apply the opposite current density, there's a narrowing of the spin wave mode. Now we're out of plane. Uh, and so the um, there's also contributions to the uh, amplitude of these signals due to uh, basically photovoltage effects. Okay, so then what we do is we vary the bias current at a fixed angle and we, we, we track what is happening to the, the, the line width. And so again, the line width is proportional to the damping. And so we see that we have a linear dependence of the line width on the damping, the slope of which characterizes the strength of the torque. And then what we do is we basically vary the angle of the applied field and the angular dependence gives us the symmetry of the torque. So this is shown that the torque uh, changes sign under magnet. This is a, a rotation by uh, 180 degrees or magnetization reversal. Okay, so shown here for this nickel 70 iron sample is what the uh, the slope of the 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 chain of the line width versus uh, bias current as a function of angle, and we see that we have a large torque with a uh, uh, novel symmetry. We have some small contribution in the x y plane, so. Uh, when we're at 90 degrees, this is this is along the y-axis. We attribute that to the spin hall torque in the Tantalum gold underlayer, which uh, in the previous planar hall torque data I showed, this is a very small contribution. However, we see a large out-of-plane contribution. So uh, here, this, these values are large. Um, that's large in this YZ plane. And just the to point out that the planar hall torque had a large component in this XZ plane. So this is uh, the... Uh, this, this torque that we're seeing here is large in this plane as we vary this. So for basically phi is set to 90 and we rotate this angle here, whereas the planal hall torque is phi is equal to zero and then we rotate the uh, theta. And this is well described by uh, theoretical prediction for anomalous hall torque induced angular dependent line width. That should follow this, this form. So that's, you can uh, find more details in this paper here. And so this is saying that the, uh, this, what the exchange, the expected change in line width uh, with applied current density uh, is given by um, what's called this AYZ. This is this is a not, this is 
the anomalous Hall torque damping efficiency uh, times this angular dependence here, which is there's a sine theta term and a sine three theta term. And I just want to point out that this is not an expansion uh, in terms of odd powers of sine theta, because you can see that the amplitude is equal. So that, that that's important. Um, and then this, there, this is the sine phi, the sine phi term. So then what we do is we, we do the similar measurement for all of our nickel iron alloys, uh, which is shown here. And we see that with increasing uh, nickel concentration, that the strength of our torque uh, increases. Um, so the torque has a clear dependence on the alloy concentration. However, what was unexpected to us uh, at one point was that it didn't change sign, which I showed you that this anomalous Hall effect, so this, what I'm calling the anomalous Hall charge effect, does change sign. So this, this at first was a mystery, which I'll hopefully in the uh, subsequent slides I'll explain. Uh, but I want to show one more piece of experimental evidence. So we want to look at microwave emission. So we make uh, essentially a spin torque nano oscillator. Um, now, for these devices, we remove the gold insertion layer. We find that the nickel iron tantalum interface has a good spin mixing conductance from broadband FMR studies. Um, and such, and, the, and the, the tantalum layer acts as a good sink. The reason we remove this gold layer is that this was shunting some of our current, and we want the current to mostly go through the FM, uh, the ferromagnet, uh, if the spin orbit torque is due to spin currents induced in the ferromagnet. Um, and then we just need this spin sinking asymmetry, which set this device satisfies. Um, so the spin torque FMR would, is much harder to measure in the system, but what we're going to do is a microwave emission measurement, which is a different type of measurement, and we don't need that gold layer to act as a strip line. Um, and I just point out that the next measurements are all done at 70 Selvin Kelvin because we are applying large current densities and we have large heating. Uh, I forgot to mention the, the previous measurements are all done at room temperature. Okay, so shown here in on the right is a schematic of the experiment. So we just put a DC current, we apply a DC current to our nanowire through the low frequency arm of a bias T. This drives, uh, when we have a large spin torque, this drives the magnetization dynamics. Again, magnetization dynamics and magneto resistance leads to resistance dynamics. So we have a DC current and microwave resistance oscillations, which gives us microwave voltage that we can detect with a spin uh, with a spectrum analyzer. And so the microwave em emission is shown here on the left, where on the x-axis, I'm plotting the applied DC current, and the y-axis is the frequency of microwave emission, and then encoded in the color is the power spectral de density of the, the, the emission. And what's shown here is um, uh, the, the, the spectra that's uh, uh, observed with the magnetization pointed uh, in this direction. And for the positive current uh, polarity, we see a coherent microwave emission. And just to uh, point out, so this is um, at this 145 degrees, which is near the maximum of uh, where we expect to see an anti-damping torque. So the change of line width is negative with applied DC current. So uh, we have negative damping for positive uh, applied, or correct, applied current. Um, we're putting a lot of current density through these uh, nanowires. So actually on for the negative current polarity, we see uh, what's essentially mag noise or thermally driven fluctuations that we can resolve. However, their output power uh, is much smaller. And also you can see that there's a large, uh, a much larger nonlinear frequency redshift uh, for the coherent microwave uh, emission, which are both signatures of uh, what would you expect for auto oscillatory behavior and not just only mag noise. Now, um, according to this symmetry, under magnetization reversal, uh, we would expect the torque to change sign, and that's exactly what we observe. So when we uh, rotate the, the, the magnetization by 180 degrees, we see that the uh, sign of the torque uh, uh, changes. So now for positive current, it's additional damping, and for negative current, this is anti-damping. Okay, so I've told you, I've shown you experimentally what we see, um, and now I would like to spend the rest of the talk trying to convince you that this is in fact due to anomalous Hall uh, effects. Okay, so what is the origin of the spin orbit torque? Well, the charge current density in the ferromagnet, so what I'm showing here is a cross section in this, uh, the YZ plane, 
uh, uh, up here of our of our nanowire. So if we have char charge current density flowing in the x direction, that's kind of out of the board uh, or out of your screen. Um, shown here as this plus JFM. This leads to a transverse anomalous Hall spin current that we call QZ. The magnitude depends on the FM band structure and the direction of the spin current or uh, anti, or sorry, um, magnetic moment is collinear with the sp spin momentum that it carries. So we're call it, what we, we call this the anomalous Hall spin current because it's, the, it's essentially the spin sector analog of the anomalous Hall uh, charge current uh, shown here. So this is the typical anomalous Hall char anomalous Hall effect current that you would measure, uh, or that you that you, that you're probably more familiar with. So this uh, anomalous Hall uh, Hall spin angle is uh, basically the spin sector analog of this anomalous Hall charge angle, as shown before. Okay. Um, so in the literature, this uh, anomalous Hall spin angle is usually broken down into two components, which is more the more well-known anomalous or spin anomalous Hall effect angle, or the spin Hall angle, and what's called uh, the spin anomalous Hall angle. Uh, now the thing is, these these add in the these these have the same symmetry, so that we are only sensitive to the al algebraic sum of these two torques. So in an infinite ferromagnet, this uh, anomalous Hall spin angle characterizes the anomalous Hall spin current uh, uh, totally. However, in our nanowire device, or in basically any sample, we aren't an infinite ferromagnet. And that's, so that doesn't have a consequence. So, and that's due to this anomalous Hall charge current. So this anomalous Hall charge, this charge current leads to this well-known charge accumulate accumulation in a finite sample. And this is what we call the anomalous Hall effect. So it has this, this, this symmetry where you can see this, this in our geometry, this MY comes from the fact that uh, the, um, this goes as like an M cross E. So we're looking at, if we have a Z, Z direction, um, uh, this, this is given by this, this M cross E that's you, uh, the E field and the magnetization that's usually for the anomalous Hall effect. Now, again, similar to our toy model that I showed, I, I explained before for the planar Hall effect is that we can't keep accumulating charge. We can't have unfinished charge accumulation. So in the steady state, this means that this charge accumulation needs to drive a counterflow charge current. So this charge, this counterflow current is just given by the, uh, basically it's, it goes in the opposite direction and has equal magnitude to the anomalous Hall charge current. Now this, Backflow charge current is a longitudinal transport in a ferromagnet. So the polarized, so this, this charge current is then polarized with its direction and magnitude of the spin current density is given by the intrinsic polarization uh, that's usually written down as P that takes on values between negative one and one. And that's of the ferromagnet. So the net effect of this anomalous Hall charge current in a finite sample is that it leads to this backflow of spin current density that's given by this, uh, this equation here, where this P is the polarization and this uh, anomalous Hall, this is the anomalous Hall charge angle, which is uh, what in the literature is usually just called the anomalous Hall angle. This is the transverse resist resistivity over the longitudinal resistivity. Okay, so the this 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 net uh, uh, spin current that we have is just given by the the sum of the spin current densities uh, arising from the spin anomalous Hall effect and the spin uh, Hall effect, which we're calling the anomalous Hall spin currents, and this backflow spin current. And just to note, in our uh, in our geometry, my is not. The, the, the direction my is not given by nothing other than just sine theta sine phi. And so we can collect these terms. And um, so we see that we have this charge to spin, we're governed by this charge to spin conversion efficiency and in just an intrinsic spin efficiency. So how does this lead to a torque? Well, again, we need to assume, or what we need to have asymmetric spin current sinks on the top and the bottom. So shown here, uh, for a device like ours, we assume we have a large spin accumulation, um, US, at the interface when we have a poor spin sink, so we can't efficiently scatter these spins. In our case, that's at the top. 
And we have uh, negligible spin accumulation at the interface with a good spin sink. So in our case, that's at the bottom. So we have some spin accumulation that looks like this. Uh, this, this, this shown here. Okay. Um, and then furthermore, when you have uh, this, the, the conversion efficiency of such a spin accumulation into current induced damping actually goes as the MZ projection squared, or it has a cosine squared theta dependence. And that's actually worked out uh, in this paper here as well. Um, and then if we assume maximum efficiency uh, of this conversion of this spin, of this net spin uh, current or spin accumulation to a damping, we, we get a, uh, we, it has a form, it has a form like this, okay? And so this depend, it's inversely dependent on the, uh, the magnetization and the thickness of the ferromagnet. It's proportional to what we're calling the total anomalous Hall torque angle. It's proportional to the charge current density in the ferromagnet. And then it has this cosine squared sine theta sine phi term. And that's this is this this is this uh, this term here that we this this form that we've seen here. Just noting that this trig identity, if we can turn this this cosine squared theta sine theta, can be written as one quarter sine theta plus sine three theta. Uh, and then putting these two equations together, we can see that this uh, efficiency of uh, um, this these anomalous Hall torques to create anti-damping effects or to change the line width is given by something like this. So we we have constants. It's just directly proportional to the anomalous Hall torque angle, inversely proportional to the saturation magnetization and the thickness of the ferromagnet. Um, I just point out that this this getting to this equation, we're we're neglecting things like anisotropy and things like that. Okay, so we can convert our uh, the data that we directly measure to this AYZ just using this equation. Um, so this, this 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 efficiency looks like this. Okay, so this is what our experimental result would be. Uh, and then on the right, I'm gonna actually, we're gonna try to calculate what we'd expect for AYZ as a function of the nickel alloy concentration. Well, I already showed that we can we measure this anomalous Hall charge angle. This is this essentially this anomalous Hall angle. This is the transverse uh, resistivity charge resistivity over the um, uh, the longitudinal charge resistivity. Uh, we estimate the polarization. We can't directly measure it uh, from literature values for uh, such such systems. And then for this anomalous Hall spin angle, uh, we don't know of any experiment where this has been measured. Uh, however, we can estimate it from uh, our experimental ferromag uh, for ferromagnetic metal conductivity and calculated values of the transverse spin hall spin conductivity uh, for nickel and iron, which we reported in this this very nice paper here. And we interpolate between different uh, these values uh, between nickel and iron, uh, and we interpolate between the polarization, and we use our that and. It, in conjunction with our experimental data, we calculate a dependence that looks like this. And I just like want to point out that this is a calculation. There's uh, no fit parameters. And what's interesting, uh, importantly, this shows that not only do we qualitatively capture uh, the dependence, is that we actually capture the correct sign uh, from, the, from, from, from theory. And we also capture even the right magnitude, not even just order of magnitude, the, the, the magnitude that we calculate is strikingly, strikingly close. Um, and now, so this, this AYZ is directly, this, 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 this AYZ is directly proportional to this anomalous Hall torque angle. And during these calculations, we actually calculate these terms separately. So what we see is that these, the dominant effect in this system, which mean which is preventing us from going positive and negative in, in the value of the total anomalous Hall torque effect, is given by this anomalous Hall spin angle, which is this again, this is this, this is the sum of the spin hall angle and the spin anomalous hall angle. However, the uh the the consequence of being a finite uh, system, the anomalous hall charge uh accumulation that leads to this backflow current actually has a, a pretty strong dependence. And the, the important thing is that this can actually add constructively or destructively. So for our uh, going towards, towards more iron rich, this is actually adding destructively. So it's subtracting, whereas it can enhance the effect uh, in our nickel rich systems. 
Okay, so we see that we have a spin or orbit torque that matches both, so it matches the angular dependence that's expected for our, uh, an anti-damping torque associated with the anomalous Hall spin currents and charge currents. It matches the sign and it actually matches the magnitude of what we'd expect from um, uh, a mix of interpolating uh, theoretical values and experimentally uh, measured parameters. So I would therefore argue that this is justified to call this a novel's Hall torque as it is due to both a novel's Hall spin and charge currents. Okay, and finally coming back to this picture that I showed before, uh, um, this is almost all torque actually has an, a new symmetry uh, relative to previously discovered, say, Rochbach torques, planar hall torques. Um, this is large in this YZ plane. So similar to the planar hall torque, it's large out of plane. It also shows four extrema and 360 degrees of rotation. However, it's uh, not biaxial. It is actually, uh, it changes sign under magnetization reversal, which is uh, similar to the spin hall torque. And you can, uh, again, in this, 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 this theory work, you can see the, the full form of this anomalous Hall torque. So what I showed before is uh, neglecting uh, anisotropies. This should be the full form of the torque. And you can add that to your uh, macro spin or micromagnetic LLG evolvers. Uh, and then just the in the form uh, with, uh, um, say, experimentally accessible parameters, uh, you can see in our, our recent archive. Okay, so finally, most and most importantly, here's the team. So this was done with uh, Ada Pai and uh, Ilya Krivorotov at UCI. Um, and in summary, we find we have found a giant anti-damping spin orbit torque that's associated with this. Uh, that's this unusual symmetry. It's found in these normal metal ferromagnetic nano nanowires that have broken inversion symmetry, uh, particularly with respect to uh, spin scattering. Uh, the in origin of this new torque is the anomalous Hall spin and charge currents in the ferromagnetic conductor, uh, which should be universally uh, present in conductors. I mean, and but this can be uh, positive, negative, zero. Uh, and we have realized the creation of a new type of spin torque nano oscillator uh, based on this, this spin torque. And then I would argue that together with the spin Hall torque and the planar Hall torque, this anomalous Hall torque forms a triad of universal Hall type spin orbit torques that you can find in ferromagnetic and uh, normal metal systems. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. We can use the reactions buttons on Zoom to thank the speaker. And uh, this talk is open for questions. If you are, you are on Zoom, please raise hand. And uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, you should be able to see a chat box to the right of the screen and uh, type a question there. So the first question by Professor Zhang Chen, please go ahead and unmute the next question. Hi, Eric. Um, yeah, thanks very much for the, for the uh, inspiring talk. So um, I, have a, I have a question about the relations between um, the magnetic resistance, which you laid out um, in different types at the beginning of your talk and the spin orbit ar torque. So from the perspective of Ansager's uh, reciprocity relation, it seems that what is a reciprocal to spin torques um, should be you know, something dynamical. For example, the spin motile force or spin pumping, or anyway, it's the generation of uh, electron motion um, by the dynamics of the magnetization. Um, but not the you know the 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 magneto resistance be, and 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 also you know from a um, microscopic perspective, what determines the spin torque and what determines the magneto resistance are different uh, you know ingredients. So I'm not entirely sure that you know we could have a truly consistent picture. Uh, respecting the Ansager's relation by, you know, juxtaposing the spin torques with magneto resistance rather than, you know, the spin pumping or spin uh, module force or something like that. So could you maybe please comment on this perspective? Yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, yeah. So the, the 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 idea is that I'm, I was trying to convey that there's a, there is a relation. And so, um, these are all spin, these are, 
you have if you have spin dependent transport right and spin torques are related so what so what you're saying so like say say spin pumping and uh spin transfer torque are directly related by on search reciprocity um i it was more to motivate that these are these are you you have related effects so if you see one then maybe you should look for the other uh, is more what I'm going at rather than some um, uh, like some law or something like this. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, I raised this question because in a recent investigation, we found you know that the magneto resistance and the spin orbit torque might not always you know indicate each other. So sometimes the their relations are rather subtle and not just uh, something apparent. So that's why I raised this question. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree that, that this wasn't meant to be some some law, that, that it's just uh, if you have spin-dependent transport and spin-dependent reflectivity, uh, mm -hmm. these two ingredients, um, yeah, there, there wasn't some law, I guess I would just say. Like, does that make okay. sense? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Professor Alex Koblap, please go ahead and ask a question. So I, I have a question somewhat related. So because you are looking at charge current and then it turns into spin current and effectively it makes your magnetization, for example, shorter due to this spin transfer. So that presumably should not affect the transversal dynamics of magnetization. So essentially, uh, that's the question to your explanation that you offered. And another question then, if you add a contact on top and bottom and shunt these contacts, uh, then uh, should that have a strong effect on your measurements you expect? Okay, so to, to, okay, to the first part, um, the question, can you just rephrase that question, just um, reiterate? Uh, so, so essentially, um, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, so spin the spin accumulation. Well, if it's collinear to the magnetization, you do not expect it to exert a torque. Yeah, it should not change magnetization dynamics. It's kind of you lose angular momentum so the, along the magnetization. You could argue, say, there's say two. I could think of like say two mechanisms, for example, uh, some magnetic me mechanism where you have some third intermediary that you talk to some magnetic cloud. Or if you think of it in an example for like in a SD like picture, which is the preferred picture I like to think about in is that these these anomalous Hall and planar Hall uh, effects uh, give you a tuning of the S like electrons, which then can couple to the D like electrons. And if they have different scattering rates, they can exert torques. This but, but it's just the uh, it's just conservation of angular momentum. If you lose angular momentum along magnetization, how can you have a torque? Yeah, so this is so how do you for example, this would be some like argument. So the the spin hall torque, for example, should not work. Uh if it has a m cross m cross p, why is it strongest with p and you invoke some thermal fluctuation or something like that? No, it has this normal spin orbit torque has a preferred direction. But in your explanation, the only direction you have is the direction de defined by the magnetization. No, and well, and the broken inversion symmetry and the current direction are important too. Yeah, but in your explanation, I did not see any other vectors. You just said that you lose angular momentum al along magnetization. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So the 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 full form will be like something like this. Yeah. No. So if you look at your paramagnet, it loses angular momentum, right? And that mm -hmm. causes the torque. But if angular momentum has the same polarization as magnetization, how can it how can it induce any magnetization dynamics? So what I'm saying that your explanation probably needs to be slightly updated. Okay. All right. Thank you for a nice talk. Okay. We'll go to Mahanjo. Please go ahead and ask your question. 
Hi, um, very good presentation, Eric. Um, so I have a question uh, related to the um, anisotropy, uh, if there is any present. So right now you have a current flow along X. So if you make devices uh, current flowing along Y or uh, along 45 degree, uh, if, if you see any uh, difference uh, in your results. Um. Well, yeah, so it's going to be the the specific MY is a consequence of our uh, our 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 current density or our E field is defined to be in the X direction. Uh, if you have some different geometry, it's actually going to follow something that's, that's shown here with this JFM. It just happens that our JFM is in the X direction uh, in, in, in this specific geometry. Now I, I see that, but what I mean is like uh, uh, you have grown in certain substrate, right? So uh, if you uh, so if we if we make device just the same device, but you rotate mm -hmm. by ninety degree, now your current flow is along y axis, right? The same device, but you are so that, making just, yeah. I don't see how that's not just a rotation of coordinate system. Um, do you? The, the effect doesn't depend on the coordinate system that you define. Uh, maybe I'm missing something that you're. You know, from the, like you know, from the material perspective. So you uh, you flow current along a axis versus b axis. If you see any difference, so that's my question. Oh, if like in something that has uh, a like in a magnetic anisotropy built in, I'm not exactly under understanding the question. So if you took the same nanowire and you just rotate it, the axes by 90 degrees, not, there's no difference. But if you are, are, are you talking like you have some intrinsic uniaxial anisotropy or something like this? Or uh, Since it's related with the magnetization, right? So maybe uh, there is some anisotropy present. Um, Maybe just I'm I, not I'm sure. I'm sorry, just, I'm not quite yeah. getting the question. But so this this form you could include into the LLG, mm -hmm. and your anisotropies would be included in this H effective. Um, does that help answer? It? Yeah, it seems it will not make. Uh, yeah, I think yeah we can get uh, yeah. Uh, that's possible, so yeah. If you do nothing but just rotate the coordinate system, that's not going to change the physics. Okay. Mahanjo, are, are you referring to if the sample has certain, um, it's a single crystal, so it has the crystal uh, anisotropy? Um, Depending on whether the axis is aligned. Oh, it's somewhat, uh, somewhat, yeah, somewhat close, yeah. So if you want to introduce extra anisotropy to this system, is that like for example, uh, let's let's think of uh, MOT to results, right? So there is a axis versus b axis. There is a low crystal symmetry. Then in a, I, I don't remember exactly, uh, but in one axis you get unconventional spin, but another axis you will not get unconventional spins. So if anything similar happens here, so that's my question. I, 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 do you do you mind following up with me? I, 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 um, okay, I we can, we, yeah, we, uh, no worries. Yeah, we can like you know start offline. Yeah, so okay. no worries. Yeah. Great. Um, do we have a in case we are there a question from the audience? Let me check on YouTube. Um, but I, I actually want to ask a, a quick question um, regarding the angle dependence. Now, um, it seems that the formula suggested it should be sine theta uh, cosine theta squared. Square. That would suggest uh, in this graph, if the magnetization is aligned along the y direction, then the AHT anonymous hole torque is strictly zero, right? Yes. But 
Why should that be? Because this is a geometry where you would expect the so, anomalous sorry, to be anomalous to take part. Let me let me clarify. The anti-damping response, the change in the damping, is okay. zero. The total torque is not zero. The so the dissipative damping. component of the torque, or the divergence of the torque, is non is zero along the y-axis, but the net torque is not zero. So uh, if the magnetization is along y direction, and I'm just thinking mm -hmm. about a anomalous Hall effect, uh, you are generating a perpendicularly flowing spin current with spin polarization along the y direction. So that's exactly the same as what a spin Hall effect will give rise to. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is gonna leak out of the ferromagnet to be absorbed by the non-magnetic non materials. And it's still gonna cause a backflow in a subject bed, but why wouldn't this configuration generate an anti-damping torque because the spin is either parallel or anti-parallel with the magnetization. Yeah, so the, uh, I'll, I'll show you some, okay, yeah. So if you, if you go to this, this paper that shows um, uh, the first theory for these self-induced spin orbit torques in ferromagnets, uh -huh. specifically with relating to um, uh, anomalous hall and planar hall effects, uh, just in, in their notation, so this is your LLG. The torques we're looking at have a form like this, where the spin accumulation has a form like this, where this theta H is anomalous hall like, and this uh, rho MR are planar hall like. Okay. Uh, what, what you find is if you have a torque, if you add this torque, say so just one of these terms, uh, to this LLG, you then linearize your LLG and you add a drive that's say b e to the negative i omega t where this b is your say fmr drive this is small uh -huh. you assume damping small uh you linearize you solve the llg you linearize and you solve for the transverse microwave susceptibility given by here what you find is that these torques lead to a modification to the transverse susceptibility that has this term that goes as the spin accumulated density and the projection in the z direction squared. This okay. term here is what turns the torque off in the y-axis. Because z dot and then they were equal to zero? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll have to look into this. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. About, about it. yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, do we have any other question? Uh, if not, we'll turn off the live streaming and uh, the recording for this session.